I've always been a bit confused as to just what the Audi Coupe was. It launched at the same time as its older brother, the insane sure-footed Audi Quattro that proved four-wheel drive didn't just belong on utility vehicles. This car, like a mountain goat on a sugar rush, cast Audi in a whole new light. But just what was this Audi Coupe doing? Was it Audi's way of cashing in on the Quattro's success? It seemed like just some cheap knockoff, a sheep in wolf's clothing. As we'll see, that wasn't the case at all. In fact, it was the Quattro that borrowed from its less powerful sibling. This is the Audi Coupe story. Audi dabbled with coupés a decade before the Audi Coupé launched with the Audi 100 Coupé S, released in September 1969. Based on the new Audi 100 saloon, it had a bit of a Aston Martin DBS look about it, but clearly Audi thought sales of only 30,000 cars over six years was disappointing because when the new Audi 100 appeared in 1976, it didn't include a coupé. Audi tried a coupe concept based on the Audi 80 in 1973 with the help of Carmen, but it didn't go beyond a concept. The Audi 80 had proven a sales success, so naturally by the mid 70s, a replacement was in the works. Once again, it would share a chassis with the Volkswagen Passat, and with that car going after the hatchback market, it made sense to continue to offer the Audi 80 as a saloon. It was a winning formula, so why change it? The initial design of the new Audi 80 was created by Klaus Luther, who'd been mainly responsible for the Audi 50 that became the Volkswagen Polo, but after he moved to BMW, the job was given to Giugetto Giugiaro. But with Audi 80 sales booming, it made sense to expand the range. Making a hatchback or an estate would cannibalize sales from the Passat, so the next logical shape, especially for Audi who were moving into the luxury market, was a coupe. It would be a little bit bigger than Volkswagen's other coupe, the Golf-based Scirocco that was already proving a strong seller. This would give Audi's lineup an exciting sporty model, something to take the fight to BMW, especially as they didn't yet have a coupe. The competition would be Opel's Manta and Ford's all-conquering Capri, so Audi's new car needed a good engine to give it some speed. Their unconventional 1.9-litre five-cylinder engine driving the front wheels would prove to be no slouch, but it wasn't as fast as the Capri with its three-litre engine or Opel's Manta with just a two-litre. But Audi's new car had the advantage of fresh new looks, important in the fashion-conscious coupe class, and great handling which would, with any luck, run rings around its competitors. It wasn't just about speed though, when coupled with a generous fuel tank and a choice of an automatic or a five-speed manual, this made for a comfortable Grand Tourer. The job of styling the new Audi Coupe would be given to Giugetto Giugiaro, who would also style the Audi 80 update that would launch in 1978. The front was similar to the 80, except for the shallower raked windscreen and twin halogen headlamps that gave the car a purposeful look. The low sloping rear still gave enough headroom for rear passengers. How do you like to say it wasn't a 2 plus 2 but a 2 plus 3? Although like mini coupes they had to clamber over the front seats and when they got there they'd find there wasn't much legroom. And despite the low sloping rear this wasn't a hatchback. It had a good sized boot but access was hampered by a high sill and small boot lid so you might need help getting a heavy suitcase in and out. At the back was large red coupe lettering under the license plate, similar to some Porsches and a small rear spoiler that showed the car meant business. As Audi's marketing blurb would say, it was racy but spacey. Inside it was clear that the Audi brand was moving up market, with a well-appointed interior and better sound deadening to reduce road noise. Options included electric windows, power steering and central locking. The dashboard understandably borrowed heavily from the Audi 80, but included a new steering wheel and the obligatory oil pressure, temperature and voltage meters that appeared on all sports cars. The econometer front and center showed this wasn't purely a sports car. Audi had an eye firmly on fuel economy and was keen to show off how the five-cylinder would keep up with the V6s on the drag strip, 
but also best them at the petrol pump. All this luxury and frugality, though, came at a cost. When it launched, the Audi Coupe was more expensive than the Lancia Beta, Renault Fuego or BMW 320. The German military was looking for an amphibious Jeep-style vehicle and approached Volkswagen to produce one in limited numbers. VW passed the development work to Audi, who came up with the Iltis or Type 183. In the process, they came up with a four-wheel drive system that was strong, compact and surprisingly light. Not only that, they found it could work well on passenger cars. The team tried marrying it with their largest power plant, the five-cylinder turbocharged engine from the upcoming Audi 200 Turbo, and trying it out on their smallest chassis, the upcoming 1978 Audi 80. And what better body to use for this pocket rocket than the upcoming Audi Coupe? The result would be the Audi Quattro, and it surprised Audi with how effective this was both on the pavement and off it as well. Recent rallying rule revisions allowed four-wheel drive cars, so it was natural Audi would look to take their new creation racing. If you're going to race a car, you have to make a certain amount of road-going versions, so although the Audi Coupe was headed for production, Audi decided the new Audi Quattro would also have a limited run. As production neared, it wasn't clear-cut if either car would be successful. The Ford Capri sales were down despite a new model in 1978. Volkswagen's own 1976 Golf GTI was kindling a hot hatch revolution that would catch fire in the 1980s. The public loved the Audi 80. Over 800 were being produced every working day. But would the coupe be a success? Both cars broke cover at the Geneva Motor Show in spring 1980. The coupe looked exciting, but all eyes were on the Quattro. It's a bit like winning the 100m sprint at the school sports day. No one cares about your triumph because your older brother has just become the first person to break the 4 minute mile. The Audi Coupe GT's 113 horsepower 1.9 litre engine got to 60 in 9.7 seconds and on to 114 miles an hour but the Audi Quattro's 2.1-litre turbocharged 137-horsepower engine got to 60 in just 6.7 seconds and on to 137 miles an hour, and it did all of this with permanent four-wheel drive. No wonder Auto Car would write, getting back into an ordinary car is like stepping back into the past. Compared to the Quattro, it was tough for the coupe to get a look in, but one advantage was its striking similarity to its bigger brother, right down to the twin headlights found on the top of the range Audi 200 Turbo. It was also almost half the price of the Audi Quattro, not too shabby when you could carefully attach a Quattro logo on the back of your coupe. Passengers might suspect something when they notice the econometer on your dashboard though. The Quattro was the ultimate halo car, selling more than just coupes, but it must have helped the coupe success in particular. When motoring critics got a hold of the Audi Coupe, they found a car with neutral handling despite having an engine so far forward, allowing this sporty car to write the checks that its looks promised. They did find reversing difficult though with a high rear window. The Renault Fuego launched as a coupe competitor that same year, but the Audi, with its quattro bigger brother and quiet refined cockpit that seemed to cut above, shrugged off the competition. To get better fuel economy in the light of another fuel shock in 1979, Audi released the 1.6 litre Coupe GL just after launch without a rear spoiler. But this frugal version didn't really catch on. The Audi Quattro was doing well on the rallying circuit and a two-wheel drive 225 horsepower Audi Coupe was entered into the European Touring Car Championships in 1981, winning in Zolder in Belgium. Just a year after both the Coupe and the Quattro broke cover, Pininfarina, with Audi's blessing, showed off what their concept of a new Audi Coupe might look like. The Audi Quartz had an aluminium and Kevlar skin and a new futuristic interior, but being 30 centimeters shorter with a low sloping back, rear passengers would have a cramped journey if this car ever made it to production. 
the most appropriate exhaust for an Audi was a nice touch and something Audi should do on all of its cars. It was clear that the coupe was popular, but customers were looking for more power. So out went the 1.6 litre engine and the econometer with its annoying light that told you to change gears for maximum efficiency. And in came a larger 2.1 litre five cylinder engine that got the car to 60 in just over eight seconds, yet could still get over 30 miles per gallon when driven carefully. Yes, the fifth gear was still for economy, but it was the first four gears that gave the car the most fun and allowed good overtaking acceleration on country roads. And that's what really mattered. The Quattro system was clearing up on the rallying circuit, dominating on Pike's Peak, and Audi was keen to turn racing wins into sales. They started making Quattro versions of their mainstream cars, starting with the Audi 80 in 1982 and Audi 100 and 200 in 1984. That year, the coupe also became a Quattro, along with a coveted badge on the back, but without the turbocharger. Four-wheel drive gave the car sensational acceleration, especially off the lights, and with the help of ABS, braking could get up to 1G. The Audi Quattro and faster Audi Quattro Sport, seen here not so subtly overtaking arch-rival Porsche, still held the performance records, but were still eye-wateringly expensive. Audi were hoping their Quattro system would sell well, it seemed to offer so many safety and performance advantages with few downsides, so it was expected 30% of all Audis would be Quattros, but the take-up rate fell well short of this. It seemed customers just didn't feel a need for permanent four-wheel drive in temperate climates on the school run. The Coupe Quattro didn't fare well either, with just 8,000 sold up to 1987, and they're now harder to find than the original Audi Quattro. Along with four-wheel drive, the coupe got a small update. The front lights had been altered a year earlier, but for 1984, the rear lights were tinted and the bumpers integrated. The coupe also got the Quattro's larger rear spoiler. All this improved the drag coefficient, not to the levels of the new Audi 100, but at least better than the old car, which moved through the air like a brick. Inside, the new steering wheel, reprofiled dashboard and new switchgear kept the coupe looking modern, especially in black rather than 1970s brown. A 2.3 litre engine taking the 0-60 time down below 8 seconds for the first time appeared in 1986, but a year later production ended after a respectable 169,000 cars were produced, although this paled compared to the 1.5 million Audi 80s produced during the same time period. After retooling the factory, a new version of the coupe was launched in 1988, again using an updated version of the Audi 80 and Volkswagen Passat chassis, this time lengthened just a smidge. That meant gaining a fully galvanized body, giving improved rust proofing. Like the original coupe, the styling was based on the Audi 80, released two years earlier, all curvy, rounded, and with a shape dictated by a wind tunnel like many cars of the late 1980s. This time it was styled in-house, likely with the help of Jay Mays, who'd worked on the Audi 80 and would go on to work on the Volkswagen New Beetle. Unlike the original coupe, this new model wasn't just a modified Audi 80, but a whole new styling exercise. It seemed the increase in development budget was because Audi had more confidence it would sell well. One major advantage, depending on how you looked at it, was the coupe was a hatchback for the first time. It made loading and unloading easier, although the awkward high boot line remained. The rear spoiler was now color-coded and wrapped around the rear. The shape was a lot more aerodynamic than the old model, not quite as good as the 0.29 of the new Audi 80, but at 0.32 it was as good as the Audi 100. The coupe was offered with a 20-valve 2.3-litre engine, giving a pulse racing 168 horsepower. It was offered in a smaller 2-litre 158 horsepower form in Italy, sneaking under tax rules while allowing mad Italian drivers to have fun on the Autostrada. But the coupe's performance didn't upstage the original Audi Quattro that continued to sell in its original shape. Inside there was a leap in luxury. Leather seats had appeared in 1986, but those seats were now electronically adjustable. The steering wheel looked leather-wrapped, along with a simulated leather dashboard with wood inlays. 
Like the original coupe had competition from the smaller Volkswagen Scirocco, the new coupe had competition from the smaller Volkswagen Corrado launched around the same time and with similar performance. Vauxhall Opel launched the Calibra to replace the Manta that had long since passed its sell-by date. When BMW updated the 3 Series in 1990, they made a coupe version to add to the competition. The German coupe market was getting very crowded. A part of the new coupe design was a cabriolet, but it took another three years for it to arrive. This meant that being designed to work without a roof, the coupe had a very rigid chassis. The venerable Audi Quattro was finally replaced after 10 years with the Audi S2 and was complemented by the new Audi S4 saloon based on the Audi 80. It didn't quite have the potency of the Audi Quattro Sport, but still packed a 5.8 second 0-60 punch, again using a 2.2 litre engine from the Audi 200. Around the same time, the coupe got a small-ish update. The front half of the car got a chassis improvement from the updated Audi 80, and the new top-of-the-line engine was a V6, which, despite the large capacity, wasn't a great deal faster. The coupe ended production in 1996. Customers were initially directed to the Audi A4, the new name for the Audi 80, but soon the Audi TT ended up filling the compact coupe hole in their lineup. The Cabriolet version stayed in production a little longer until the Audi TT Roadster appeared to steal its thunder. Today, the closest relative of the original coupe is the Audi A5, a two-door 2 plus 2 coupe based on the Audi A4 chassis like the original coupe. That car has grown both physically with the five-door sportback version and in performance with the S5 and RS5 versions, getting the car to mind-blowing performance levels the Audi Quattro could only have dreamt of with a 2.9-litre, 444-horsepower engine, getting the car to 60 in just 3.7 seconds. It does all this, of course, with Quattro four-wheel drive. The Audi Coupe may have been the often overlooked younger brother of the wild, manic Audi Quattro, but it provided all the power you really needed on public highways. It did all this reliably and with a touch of class for a much more reasonable price. Maybe then the sum of its parts ended up being, for the money, superior than its wayward older brother. To hear some more about the Audi Coupe, click the optional extra video on the right. And I talk a bit about 1980s Audis with the Audi V8 video that's also on the right. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.